Sunday. Woo, you made it through the snow, the 47 inches we were threatened with. I'll tell you what, guys, we have a special guest, and I just can't, I can't get into my sermon without telling it, not you, Dave Coover, but we are grateful you're here, too. My high school band director and several of his family is here today. And this is, yeah, you can clap for that if you want. That's fine. No problem. <clears throat> this is the man. Ryan, do we have that picture? This is the man who is responsible for this right here. <laughs> just, just want you all to know that, okay? So blame him. I had hair at one time. Mr. Connell and Jody, when I got a text earlier this week saying there's a chance that they're coming through, and he just retired this year. And this guy, he is ageless. He looks the exact same as he did 30 years ago. And he is a legend. And we are honored to have you here. I tell you what, he is an amazing man, one of the best conductors I have ever sat under in my life. Phenomenal trombone player. We would do duets every now and then. And there's a bunch of great marching band stories that I can't share from the pulpit. But see me after church and uh, make sure you welcome them. It is an honor to have you guys here. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Played a big, big role, helped me get into Sanford, helped me get a scholarship there on Euphonium, and uh, we're grateful to have it. All right, so today, I just got to dive into this Palm Sunday. I am so fired up. A hundred years ago, there was a priest who was walking on the Soviet border. Actually, it was right before the Soviet Union took shape. It was pre-Revolutionary War Russia. And this soldier stops this priest, and he levels his gun right at him. And he asks three very loud commanding questions. Boom, rapid fire. Who are you? Where are you going? And why are you going there? Now, that would have <laughs> stopped most of us in our tracks right there. But this priest was unfazed. And he looks right at the soldier. He doesn't answer right away. And he, he takes a thoughtful moment. And he says, soldier, how much do they pay you? The soldier was not expecting that. He, he drops his gun just a little bit. He says, 25 kopecks a month. Why? And the priest smiled. And he took another moment. He says, I'll tell you what. I have a proposal for you. I will pay you 50 kopecks a month if you promise to stop me here every single day and ask me to answer those same three questions. Who are you? Where are you going? More importantly, why are you going there? See, those three questions, they stop us in our tracks and ask us, who are we? There's our identity, who we are in Christ. Where are you going? There's a direction. And then purpose. Why are you going there? And that's what I love about Palm Sunday, because what it does is it tells us, stop, take a time out, do a little evaluation. As we look at this first day of Holy Week and we go through this week, why are we doing what we do? Where are we going? Why is Holy Week even a big deal? We've got, you know, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. We've got, you know, we know what happens on Easter. Do we really grasp the events of Palm Sunday? Because it's a beautiful snapshot. It's like a it summarizes all of Jesus' life right here. It shows his conviction, his passion of what he knew was coming. Because this is an incredible event. And I think we, we get lost in this. We don't understand that Palm Sunday sets up Easter. We're cheering them on. Woo, yeah, it's great. He comes in. You know, you might have heard it called the triumphal entry. And that's exactly what it was. But there's something special going on when not one gospel, not two gospels, not three, but all four gospels record this event. That's almost unheard of. All four Gospels, when they record this, you know it's kind of a big deal. This is something we're supposed to know about. This is something we're supposed to bring in because this triumphal entry was so incredible. It was like a massive parade. There were celebrations. People lined the streets. They were welcoming their Messiah King. But they had different ideas than what Jesus had. Oh, Jesus, don't, don't make any mistake about it. He's going to be the King. But what he did today, hmm, and for us, we look back, it's kind of bittersweet, right? Because we know Palm Sunday starts that chain of events that leads to the crucifixion. It leads to those painful, agonizing moments that he took, blameless and innocent, for me and for you to redeem the world. So let me have my volunteers, if they want to go grab the, the props for today, I want you to bring them up and just set them up here on the platform behind me. We're going to look at three symbols that are very simple that help us illustrate the truth of Palm Sunday. Three symbols that, that really look common, but they reveal an uncommon truth of why Jesus did what he did. And it showed that he goes so far and above and beyond what we're expecting, so far above and beyond what we even think we grasp about this. So come on in. We've got, uh, all right, we've got Elias here with a rock 
Awesome. We've got a rock. We've got a palm tree, and we have a very large, what is that? It's, it's, we're going to call it a donkey. It may look like a horse, but it's a donkey, all right? Three very simple, common items that tell an uncommon story. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Have a seat. Well done. All right, so we're going to go in reverse order. We're going to look at the donkey first. There is something incredible that happens when you look at this story. There is so much hidden gold right there. And, and as we set the context, remember, this is a huge parade. People are lining the streets, they're cheering, and they're having a great celebration for now. And that's where we pick up the story. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21 or pull up your favorite Bible app. I'm going to read from the CSB today. And while you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us each and every week if you can't be here in person. Matthew 21, let's read the first seven verses and then we'll keep going later on. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples, telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her foal. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, just say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went, and they did just as Jesus directed them. And they brought the donkey and its foal. Then they laid their clothes on the donkeys, and he sat on them. Wow. What is going on? Why a donkey? What, what is he thinking? Uh, what do you think of when you hear the word donkey? Do you get a mental picture? I can't help it. Every single time, anytime I hear the word donkey, this is what I picture right here. <laughs> right? And you can just hear Eddie Murphy's voice. In the morning, I'm making waffles. And that's, that's it. That's what I picture as donkey. And they always seem to have these goofy grins, even the real ones here. They, <laughs> and I just have a hard time taking the king of kings seriously when he chooses this on the surface. There's something going on here. It's such a, a bizarre thing. Why a donkey? Why this stubborn, lowly, humble mule. It's certainly not what I would have chosen. It's probably not what you would have chosen to come into town and declare your kingship. And I think, you know, maybe the, maybe the camels were all rented that day. Maybe the rent -a beast center was completely out of horses and they had to settle for this. But if you look deeper, that wasn't the case at all. Jesus chose this on purpose. Even this detail did not escape his notice. This was on purpose. This is part of God's bigger plan. In fact, all the way back in the Old Testament, Zechariah 9.9 is this prophecy. In fact, we just read it. Matthew was quoting Zechariah in that passage we opened with. Jesus specifically wanted this donkey. Why? There's so much hidden gold here. This, when I look at this, I'm thinking, that has to be plan B. <laughs> there is no way that is what he's riding into town to declare to Jerusalem and to the world the Messiah is here. And I would be wrong in assuming that. Because as I dug deeper, when you look at this donkey, and I've got another picture, you've got to admit, this is, it's cute, it's cuddly, oh, I know, sweet little donkey, you want to pet him? There's something going on here. This, when, when I think of the Roman soldiers in Jesus' day, they rode in on fancy war horses. Man, they were fired up, and they were arrogant, and they were proud, and they were strong, and they had every right to feel confident. When they showed up, they wanted you to know we're in charge. We project strength. We project power and authority. In fact, that's a tradition that would continue for 2,000 more years. You would see, even in our history, people would use war horses when they would ride into battle or when they would accept someone else's surrender. And it made a statement. They came along and they were saying, dude, we are strong. We have power. We have position. We have strength and authority. So let me ask you this. If you were Jesus, or let's just say you were any king getting ready to declare your sovereign rule you were getting ready to announce would you pick this or would you pick that because it doesn't go with human logic how goofy is it? there's elliot there's there's eric and there's me and that just i have a short circuit here i'm thinking how in the world is this kingly why would he choose it? This is Palm Sunday, and there is the hidden gem right there staring us in the face. And most people miss the fantastic irony here. Yes, the donkey is lowly, and it's showing humility, the humility represented by Jesus himself. The ironic twist here is that by riding this donkey and looking like he is humble and lowly, and he is, 
He is actually telling the world and proclaiming that he is the Messiah and the king at the exact same moment. But unless somebody points that out to us, we miss that. You see, the Jews who were gathered for Passover that week, they knew the Old Testament. They know this verse. They know Zechariah 9.9. They know Isaiah 62. There's all kinds of prophecies pointing to this moment. They would have known, what is he doing? That's a fulfillment of the Messianic prophecy. Some are loving it, and some are, you can't do that. And they're getting angry. And you got this mixed emotion, and the crowd's still cheering, and most people are happy, and they're going, woo, this is great, this is great. Jesus shows up. He's connecting the past by fulfilling his prophecy, but he's pointing to the future, saying, your Messiah, your King, has arrived. There's just one problem. It wasn't quite what they were expecting. And once again, Jesus' plan is so far above and beyond our comprehension, so much more powerful and elaborate going on. Here comes the Messiah. The Jews have been waiting for this. They have been waiting for the Messiah. He's here. He's finally coming. And look, here he comes. He's on a donkey. What is going on? And yes, he was showing the lesson for us right out of the gate. Humility is one of the most godly characteristics. Corey ten Boom, the great hero that rescued countless numbers of Jews from the Nazi Holocaust. And she was asked one day, with all her fame, with all her accolades, living almost 100 years and and having so many people thank her and praise her all the time, do you find it difficult for you to remain humble? And she smiled, that beautiful, humble smile, and she said, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, and he came on the back of a donkey, and everyone's waving their palm branches, and they're throwing their garments on the road, and they're singing praises, do you think for one second that it ever entered the mind of that donkey, this is for the donkey? No way. Not a chance. If I can be that lowly, humble donkey that allows Jesus to ride and to get glory and get honor, I have done my job. Who thinks like that? What a godly response. How beautiful. If I could just be the lowly donkey, and that shows just the humility. All right, so let's bring this down to the practical, because you know we live in Realville, and I want to show you how this affects us today. Think about it this. If Jesus knew that a donkey would be waiting for him in the next city over, then he surely knows what's down the road for you. The same Jesus. If he knows that, you may not know, you may not know how that medical test is going to turn out next week, but Jesus does. You may not know if your job is there another week or two. But Jesus does. In fact, he already knows how he's planning to make provision for you. It's his promise, right? He he feeds the sparrows. The lilies of the field aren't arrayed as nice as Solomon. Jesus knows his say. He already has it in mind. And understanding that about our Lord gives us confidence to follow him, to be bold. When the world is starting to get a little cattywampus, getting a little weird out there, people can look to us and say, man, why do you have peace? What is different about you? And you can say, hey, it's not me. I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where I found awesome food. Would you like to come? Jesus showed that beautiful humility. Let's see what happens next. Look at verse 8. Here we have the stories where the palm branches come in. Verse 8, he says, A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from trees, and they were spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee, right? Well, they were half right. He was from there, but he was more than a prophet. There was a lot going on there. Look at verse 9. There's a hidden gem right there. I love to point these hidden gems out. Verse 9, we see that great word. In fact, we sang it. Hosanna. Hosanna. And they're cheering and they're having a great time. And you think, woo, it's a victory chant. Woo, yeah. But as I studied this, that is not what Hosanna means at all. Do you know what it means? It literally means save us. Help us, Lord. Redeem us. Yet we see it in the context of this parade. It'd be like, woo. It'd be like, we think today we'd hold up our diet coat and go, dilly, dilly. Woo. Hip, hip, hooray. Hosanna. No. They're yelling, save us. (laughs) Save us, Lord. Woohoo, we're fine. Redeem us. You know why? Because they were under oppression from the Romans. Those wascally Romans. 
couldn't stand them. And they were thinking, this is it. This is the military king. Here he comes. He's going to deliver us. Then in verse 10, look, there's more hidden gold. This is, this is so, Matthew says the whole city was, quote, in an uproar. This is so good. You ready for this? Do you know the, the actual word he uses there? It's the Greek word seyo. Seyo. You know what that is? That's the same word we get, our English word, seismic, as in earthquake. Matthew is literally saying when Jesus came into town, it was such a seismic event, it was as if the world was shaken. Jesus came right again, and they were cheering. This, this sayo, this seismic event was happening. It was so loaded with power. It was like an earthquake went off on Palm Sunday. How cool is that? The crowds are there. They're waving the branches. There's this, this traditional symbol of victory, the palm proms are waving. That's why we call it Palm Sunday, in case you never were told that. And they could almost taste the sweet freedom that he was going to bring. Finally, the Messiah is coming. He's here. We've been waiting for him. We've been hungry. We've been saying, when is our Redeemer coming? He's going to overthrow those evil, wascally womans, and everything's going to be awesome. It's the perfect kingdom. The Jews are going to be favored because we're all Jews here. Eh, we're having a good time. And you could just see Peter. He's running on ahead. He's looking at the palace. He's like, that's going to be mine. He's measuring the drapes. He's already got the curtains ready. And he turns around and he says, wait a minute. Where is everybody? Because if you know the rest of the story, something happened. There was a change in the air. Now let me put this in modern day terms. I like to make this relate here. This would be such a powerful realization of how the crowd was cheering one minute and then they started to fall away on the next. All right? Imagine that you are going to surprise your kids, and you load up the family truckster, okay, you're in the family wagon, metallic pea green, and you're driving to Sunny Skies ice cream, okay, yeah, that was my reaction too. You're driving there, you got the kids in the back, and as you're going, you got your family truckster going, you hear the kids begin to chant your name, they're like, woo, you're the greatest parent in the world, woo, Hosanna, <laughs> maybe they don't say that, but they're cheering their thing, you're driving, and you know it's going to be an awesome day. Because you have another surprise in store. And just as you are about to turn into sunny skies, you make a hard left. And the kid's like, hey, Zan, what's going on? You missed the turn, Mom. No, you didn't. You had something better in store. In fact, it doesn't dawn on the kids. They're trying to wrap their head around it. But you go to RDU Airport. You say, kids, get out. You pop the back, and you've packed their bags. For a week-long trip to Disney World, followed by another week at Universal Islands of Adventure. Two weeks. And you grab it, and you're handing the suitcase, and you shut the car door, and you look at them, and imagine your shock when they look depressed. Huh? Imagine their shock. That's, no, we don't want that. We want ice cream. <laughs> Are you serious? This is exactly how it was. We, we, oh, I understand you're a heavenly king. We all get that. Son of David, oh, yeah, yeah, that's great, it's great. We read the Torah, we got it, we got it. We, we want you to be king now, though. I mean, we got our swords, right? I'm going to cut the high priest's ear off here in the garden here a little bit. And what, where, where's your sword? What, what? Something doesn't look like this is a military coup. And you're supposed to be the, the Messiah, the king, and we're ready. <laughs> we're with you. We got the plan. <laughs> if you need a plan, Jesus, we'll give it to you. Because we, we know what's going on, and we're ready for deliverance. And we show up, and this is how it is. It's like, we're going to sunny skies. Uh, no, I got something better. I got something far better. Yeah, you know what? We don't want that. We want our, our little ice cream, our precious, because we have our plans. And we think we know what's best. Oh, well, it's awfully quiet here now. Sorry about that. Too deep. This is, this is such a perfect illustration. This story gives us a glimpse into how it might have felt on that day. You could almost taste the victory. Jesus rode into town, but he wasn't there to set up an earthly political kingdom. <laughs> Certainly not yet. Yeah, he's going to reign as king. The millennial reign, that's coming. The new Jerusalem, the new heavens, the new earth. Revelation 20, 20 you can read all about it. That's coming. But first, Jesus had something so much further above and beyond. He wasn't going to just overthrow wascally womans. He was going to overthrow the oppression of sin and death in the grave, and half the people were kind of scratching their heads, like, I don't, I don't quite get this. Can't we just, like, sacrifice a lamb or something? Go get some ice cream? A temple's cool. We'll just do that. We're, we're good. We weren't good. We we're separated by our sin, and we needed somebody to tear that veil in the Holy of Holies and 
send the Holy Spirit available to any who would repent. Well, there's an R word you don't hear much anymore. It's not just easy believism. Say this prayer and you're on your way. There's a repentance. There is something. He has come to defeat the oppression of our souls. So obviously you've got people who are happy. They're cheering. Those are the ones, woo, Jesus, woo, striper. Then you got those who weren't cheering. What's going on? Something all right. Then you had those who were jealous, those who were threatened, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those people in religious authority who were threatened by him. And none of them understood the magnitude of what Jesus was doing that day. Now we get to, because we get hindsight. We get to look backwards. Even Jesus' disciples didn't get it. Check out what John wrote in chapter 12. Read with me. He says, his disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, this is after he's, he's risen from the dead, then they remembered these things that had been written and the things that were done to him. So I got to ask, I'm not waiting for the end for the challenge. What about you? Do you grasp and expect Jesus to be the Redeemer? You just celebrated on Palm Sunday? Are you ready to receive his power and his victory to go above and beyond your expectations? We limit God. I've got something to share with you, church, that I am this close to being able to release a video and tease this about it, some exciting stuff that God has done that is expanding us in ways we've never been able to do in 14 years. And it scares me because it requires a step of faith because I'm happy and I'm comfortable when I got God in my box <sighs> because I can understand and I see his ways. If you need any help, Lord, let me know. I'm right here. I'll give you the plan, right? Yeah. We laugh because we've been there. We've been there. God, I'll tell you what, you know, I'm going to pray for your will. Oh, wait, not that, though. <laughs> no, no, I thought you meant that. You know? We're real good at that. There is some incredible truth going on here. The disciples didn't even grasp it all. Palm Sunday is that perfect time to take that snapshot. Your Insta, Snap, a Chap, a Graham, whatever it is called today. You could take that thing because in that moment, you see his victory, you see his passion, you see his horrific sacrifice that was beautiful at the same time. And you see redemption all happening in this week. He showed up to Jerusalem, and they were not expecting this. They wanted some kind of campaign rally. You know, I just expect to see people lying in the streets of Jerusalem with the, make Jerusalem great again, you know, all these, these banners and stuff. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. This was not supposed to be some political thing. He wasn't there to raise money or form a pack. He was there to say, I'm going to be the king. I'm here to make a way where I am going to be the way maker. And half the people didn't grasp it. Jesus' purpose was not to be liked. He wasn't there to be popular. He didn't care if people liked him or not. Why? Because he was there to do the will of the Father. Wow. How would your world be different if you cared more about what the Father thought of you than anyone else? I came to that point. Mr. Carnell knows. <laughs> I had a crisis of faith, man. I was a long-haired, hippie rock and roller. I started going to church, and I started hearing people talk about this Jesus, and I was like, <laughs> all right, I'll take just enough to make me feel good. I got my ticket punched. And then on Friday night, I would go, and I would sing some of the most disturbing songs with the most stupid lyrics, sign a few autographs to 14-year-old girls. I was 17. Woo! <laughs> Pathetic. <laughs> What a joke. What a joke. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's not that funny. <laughs> God got a hold of me. And these are those moments where you've got to come to that, that, that crisis of belief. What, what's going to be the most important? You going to live for yourself? Most people do. You could do that and nobody would probably even bat an eye. Right? Just being honest. Even in the church. You could be as successful. You could have all it together. Jesus comes and he says, I don't care what people think. I don't care if you get it or you don't get it. This is my will. Nothing will determine. I'm going to follow the Father, and I'm going to make a way for anyone who receives. And it was powerful. And people didn't grasp that. So today, remember, we can look back. We didn't have, we, we, we have the hindsight that the disciples didn't get. You know, we love to judge them and go, man, how foolish are these disciples? They're right there. They spent what they ate with them. They spent the night in the same room with them, and they didn't get it. And they're kind of like, what? And we think, how, how silly are these men? Oh, we would be right there with them. We would be wanting one thing. We're hearing what we want to hear. Like, yeah, new ring, new king, king. All right, yeah, yeah, we're good. And then somehow these roads diverge, and then we look mad, and we're like, I don't understand it. We're going to talk more about that next week. 
what happened in that upper room. I mean, there's just some, some crazy truths here. What he showed up to do was so far above and beyond what they were expecting. Isaiah talked about this. Those words are just as relevant today. Read them with me. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord of heaven. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. That is so powerful. We serve a God that is vast and infinite and beyond us in every way, yet from above he allowed his son to be written into the story to buy us back. Most people reject it. What about you? He comes and he shows us humility. He lived among us in this beautiful solidarity, linking arms, becoming one of us so he can identify with us. So we have a high priest that we can identify with who was tempted in every way, just like us, yet without sin. That gives me hope. That gives me confidence. And then he showed incredible obedience in ways no one was expecting. Remember, the crowd at the beginning was shouting, Hosanna, woo, dilly dilly. And within days, they were shouting, crucify. Same crowd. What changed? Did Jesus change? (laughs) Not at all. Same yesterday and today. The crowd changed, and it was crazy. And all of a sudden, we're thinking, he's not what I expect. And everything boils down to this verse right here. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That who believes in him... Shouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. Maybe you're here, you haven't been in church in a long time. Maybe you're listening online. Maybe you've never been, you've never heard the good news. I just boiled down the whole gospel to one verse. It's all right there. And you need to hear this good news that your sin can be overcome. But it's not because you're strong, you're going to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. I got this, woo! I'm going to say four Hail Marys and we're going to do this. And It's not about any works we do. You don't get yourself cleaned up and then come to Christ. You come to Christ, and then he cleans you up. We get it so backwards. You can't clean yourself up. We've tried. We tried it for 3,000 years, and it didn't work. Jesus entered the story, and he changed everything. In fact, Paul wrote this in Ephesians. He says, through faith now in him, we get to approach God with freedom and confidence. What? Confidence? Are you kidding? How do you enter a holy God's throne room with confidence? Because of what Jesus did. So if you're here today, and you're wondering what this journey of Holy Week means for you. I hope you accept God's invitation. I know most of us probably have, but I would be a fool and a horrible pastor if I assumed every single person had. One beggar telling another where I found food. This can be the day that you say, you know what, I've been hearing about this. God, make, make a change. Just surrender that heart and say, you know what, Holy Spirit, I've made a mess. I hadn't killed anybody, had done this, but I know that I've done enough that I'm just separated from you. Confess your love for him. He will take you on the most unexpected journey, (laughs) like Bilbo Baggins. It'll be an eventful journey. I wouldn't trade mine for nothing. But you got to take that first step. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He will not barge in. It is your invitation. He can take what you think is impossible and make it possible because he's a powerful God. And he comes back from the dead, and he can give us that fresh start. If that soldier were to come up to you, the one we talked about at the very beginning, and he were to ask you those three questions. Who are you? Do you know your identity? Where are you going? Do you know your direction? Why are you going there? Do you have your purpose? If not, man, I would love to talk with you. I'll stay after church as long as you want. We're going to open the altar here in just a second, and you'll be able to come and just pray. No one will bother you if you just want to spend 60 seconds. Maybe you want to just sing the last song. We like to finish by singing a song, and that's what we're going to do, okay? So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have our time to uh, respond to the Lord. Bow with me. God, I thank you for your presence here in this place. You are so good. You're more than the words that we sing in songs. You're vaster than our minds can grasp, and I thank you that yet you stoop to allow us to know you by name our Yahweh Elohim, and we thank you for that. God, I thank you that it doesn't depend on me and my horrible unrighteousness to approach you, but it's all because of what Jesus did that makes us able to come to call you our Abba Father. Lord, if there's somebody here who doesn't know you today, I pray, Lord, that you would just soften their hearts and they would surrender to you and invite you to come take charge. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Do what only you can do today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.